federal inmate now getting charged with attempted murder after prosecutors say he stabbed Derek Chauvin 22 times. So this is some breaking news that's just coming into us. I want to sort of set the scene for this here. Remember who Derek Chauvin is. He's the former Minneapolis police officer convicted in the murder of George Floyd back in 2020. According to this indictment that is just out now, there was an inmate that had allegedly been planning to attack Chauvin for about a month. I want to bring in Danny Savalos for more on this now. And Danny, this is um, v interesting news to a lot of people here. We learned days ago that Chauvin had been stabbed in prison. There were questions about his condition. Uh, at the time, his family, his lawyers, trying to understand what had happened to him here. Now we're getting some new details from this indictment. Talk us through it. Yeah, basically what we're learning is that the stabbing was not just a, a one or two uh, incident. It wasn't just a single stab. It was apparently, allegedly, many stab wounds uh, that Derek Chauvin su suffered. And now he is being uh, charged for attempted murder by another inmate. Back at you with another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Just a few days ago, I told you about the person that probably stabbed Derek Chauvin, right? I gave you some different scenarios, and I can tell you that the cat that stabbed him, this guy John, a.k.a. Stranger, was once part of the Mexican Mafia. He helped bring the Mafia down, one of the original cases. Sent a big-name guy, Sapo, to the ADX for pretty much the rest of his life. Although Sapo recently filed a compassionate release motion, it's likely going to be denied. But we'll get into his story, and it's ironic. His name is Stranger, and what happens in this situation and in this case is stranger than fiction. Derek Chauvin's attempted killer was part of a big conspiracy in 1998 out of the Central District of California, and the Mexican Mafia wanted him dead. After all, he was recording them and plotting on them with the federal government. The federal government would later charge Frank Fernandez, a.k.a. Sapo, Juan Garcia, a.k.a. Tapo, Di Marino Martinez, Chewy, Jimmy Sanchez, Smokey, Max Travisco, Mano, Marcel Arvalo, Psycho, Daniel Bravo, Sporty, Robert Cervantes, Gypsy, and others with murder, attempted murder, conspiracy to commit murder, robbery, extortion, and narcotics trafficking for monetary gain. At all relevant times, according to the government, this organization was known as the M.A. or the Mexican Mafia. The government would allege that they operate in the Central District of California and elsewhere wreaking havoc on the community that they lived in. John Terzak, AKA Stranger, was once part of this powerful organization, but he had violated someone's trust and would eventually escape the murder plot that was being prepared on his life. Federal prosecutors would outline in detail the functionings of the Mexican mafia and the members that wanted John's head. Court papers on June 28, 1999 would say, the Mexican mafia is a powerful gang which controls drug distribution and other illegal activities with portions of the California penal system and which it has increasingly worked to expand its influence over illegal activities outside of prison. When Mexican mafia members or associates serve their sentences and rejoin their communities, they remain loyal to the Mexican mafia and work to further the goals of the Mexican mafia outside the prison environment. A person can be admitted to the Mexican mafia according to the government, either while he is in prison on the inside or in the community on the outside. It takes the vote of three members to admit a new member. A member of the Mexican Mafia is referred to as a brother, a carnal. The Mexican Mafia enforces its rules and promotes discipline among its members and associates by murdering, attempting to murder, conspiring to murder, assaulting, and threatening those members and associates who violate the rules or pose a threat to the enterprise. The murder or assault of a member may be carried out only if it is authorized by a vote of other members. A member may independently authorize the murder or assault of a non-member. The Mexican Mafia has attempted to organize Hispanic street gangs throughout Southern California. Members of the Mexican Mafia have contacted members of Hispanic street gangs in the Los Angeles area for the purpose of establishing a larger network for the Mexican Mafia's illegal activities. The main purpose of those meetings has been to organize Hispanic street gangs into a larger Mexican Mafia-controlled criminal organization, according to the government. One goal of the Mexican Mafia is to control narcotics trafficking in Southern California. If a gang does not accede to Mexican Mafia demands, the Mexican Mafia will assault and order the assault of the gang's members, both in custody and on the streets. This is done in part through placing a gang or individual on the Mexican Mafia's hit list, which is disseminated in various ways. Gangs or individuals on the hit list are frequently said to have a green light or a verde, although other expressions are also used at times. In addition to intimidation through direct assaults, the Mexican Mafia is able to assert control and influence over gang members outside the penal system. 
The gang members do not want their incarcerated members to be assaulted. And the gang members want protection from the Mexican mafia if they ever become incarcerated. The Mexican mafia requires street gangs to pay a tribute or a tax on a regular basis. At least that's how things were back then. If a gang pays the tax, the Mexican mafia permits gang members to exert influence over and to traffic in narcotics in their neighborhoods and territories. If a gang fails to pay the tax or otherwise fails to comply with the dictates of the Mexican mafia, the Mexican mafia will place a green light on the members of the gang, which authorizes Mexican mafia members and associates, as well as rival gangs, to assault and or murder members of the gang, both in the community and within the California penal system, until the gang pays the tax. The Mexican mafia also exercises control over non-gang narcotics dealers by taxing them. If they pay taxes, the narcotics dealers are permitted to sell narcotics in their designated areas and are protected from rivals selling narcotics in the same area. As with street gangs, if a narcotics de dealer fails to pay the tax, the Mexican mafia will authorize a hit, murder, and or assault of the narcotics dealer. Derek Chauvin's stabber stranger was a wanted man in more ways than one. In 2001, after assisting the government in helping send Frank Fernandez, Sapo, and his co-defendants to ADX for the rest of their lives, Stranger would also lose his life for 30 years. But he didn't think it would always be that way. He thought that it would be much less. The problem for Stranger, he wanted to cooperate, but stay in the life of selling drugs, and the government would rescind their cooperation agreement with him. In 1997, Stranger had become an FBI informer, providing information about his gang, as well as recordings of conversations between him, members, and associates. The investigation resulted in 40 indictments, but halfway through, John, a.k.a. Stranger, was dropped as an informant because he was dealing drugs, authorizing assaults, and extorting money. Again, Stranger wanted the benefits of cooperation, but wanted to continue living that life. And for it, he would pay with 30 years of his. With a release date of June 3rd, 2026, and a home confinement date in 2025, Stranger decided he loved prison and began plotting on killing Derek Chauvin. Stranger had become a regular in the law library at every prison he was at, and now Derek Chauvin was looking for a way out, the same way Stranger had been for years. On November 24, 2023, Stranger would become the hunter and no longer the prey. This would be the last time that Stranger would visit the law library at that Arizona prison. At 12.30 p.m., he would head out of his unit during work call with a prison shank tucked into his ass cheeks, he would walk into the law library, that old gangster feeling he used to have when he was involved in calling shots and committing violence had begun to run through his veins all over again. He knew what he would do and why he would do it. It was only known to him. Derek was a high profile inmate and Black Friday seemed fitting for what he would do to the man that had been convicted of taking George Floyd's life. He would make this a good one and he wanted to end the former cop's life here at the prison. He would commence the stabbing Derek over 22 times. He had no intention of letting him live and no intention of stopping until he had done what he had come to do. Prison cops would spray him with mace as he continued to stab. Eventually, the OC spray would overpower him and Stranger would give up on his relentless assault. When prison cops questioned him after the incident, he seemed sad to find out that Derek was not going to die. He would tell them that he wanted to kill Derek and that had they not responded so quickly, he would have died. Stranger told the SIS officers investigating the incident that Black Friday was his day as it symbolized the Black Lives Matter movement and was symbolized by the Black Hand symbol associated with the Mexican Mafia, an organization he once belonged to but turned his back on, helping send many of them to prison for the rest of their lives. Stranger, as ironic as it may seem, had not been a stranger to being on the receiving end of violence while in federal prison. He knew that just as in the streets, he was a wanted man behind the razor wire as well. In 2005, he would write a 2241 habeas corpus asking to be transferred out of the federal system to a state system where he felt he would be safe. In his petition, he would write, BOP officials continue to place my life in imminent danger by housing me at USP Atlanta, amongst many disruptive inmates and prison gang members who have attempted to murder and assault and continue to make threats of harm to my life as a result of my past cooperation with the government and the Mexican mafia investigation and assistance to SIS and the BOP authorities here at the prison. In fact, the same assailant who attempted to kill me on August 18, 2003, inmate Sonny Ciafelli is currently in a cell across from me and just recently was caught with two knives, inmate manufactured weapons, which he had threatened, stating that the knives had my name on them, meaning he has been waiting for the right opportunity for these officers to make a mistake and open my cell door so he could kill me. 
As a result of the attempted murder stabbing assault that had occurred on August 18, 2003, this inmate Giafelli, per BOP policy, is supposed to be a BOP documented separate inmate for my own safety. However, BOP officials continue to house me together with inmate Giafelli, the same assailant who attempted to kill me. He would go on to tell the court that he was housed in the shoe with other Mexican mafia members and that he feared for his life. Stranger wanted to go to the California state prison system, dropout yard, or special needs. The court would write, according to K. Sue Bailey, correctional treatment specialist for the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Southeast Regional Office petitioner must be separated from numerous inmates and gangs in the BOP system. Given the need to separate petitioner from other BOP inmates, he has a central inmate monitoring system classification. Through SIMS, the BOP can monitor the transfer, temporary releases, and community-based activities of inmates who present special concerns for prison management. Given his SIMS classification, Petitioner was denied transfer to another BOP facility, and the Southeast region began to attempt to transfer Petitioner to a state facility where he could be placed in the general population and participate in facility programs. The Southeast region did not attempt to transfer Petitioner to the California Correctional System due to his SIMS. As attested to by Ms. Bailey because of petitioner's status as a cooperating witness for the state of California, he was not eligible for placement in any institution in California, including BOP facilities, nor any state facility in the states in the Western region. The Southeast Regional Office contacted the North Carolina Department of Corrections and the Mid-Atlantic region regarding placement for the petitioner. North Carolina was not specifically chosen as the location for petitioner's transfer, but was contacted because there were no disqualifying factors for petitioner for the prisons within the state. North Carolina would accept Stranger and his problems, but place him in solitary confinement within their system, one of the worst in the country at that time. And eventually he would be transferred back to the FBOP after numerous complaints. Now Stranger sits back in a solitary confinement cell, living the life that he tried to escape by cooperating. Now he faces attempted murder charges that could and will likely end his life at the ADX around the likes of Frank Fernandez, AKA, Sapo, some things are stranger than fiction. Now, a few days ago, we talked about, you know, who is the dude that did this or why did they do it? Was it some white dope fiend? Was it some dude that didn't like the cops? Was it a black dude? But no, instead it's a dude that was associated with the Mexican mafia at one time, right? Let me tell you something, them dudes play no games. I've already said this on this channel, you know, the most dangerous gang in the system, at least to me, there were numerous South Siders. You know, I've seen the Mexican mafia dudes, Bobby and, you know, Fox. I've seen how they ran their car, right? This dude was definitely in trouble. Obviously, he gets stabbed up in his cell, but he's a weirdo. Why does he do it? Does he do it because he hates cops? I don't I mean, I don't know. He was, you know, he was assisting them. He wore a wire in that big case, and, you know, he was obviously a target. But he spends almost 25, 26 years of his life. He's about to get out. At the end of 2024, early 2025, he's going to the halfway house. He's about to get out of prison. So why would he do something like this? Was he scared to get out? Was he scared to go back to his neighborhood? Was this kind of like a check-in move? He sealed his fate. He's going to the ADX, being a cell right across from the guy that he probably testified on at some point. And now you can see how the Bureau of Prison works, right? This guy's getting stabbed. He's in danger. He's writing them. They're like, bro, we don't care. The dude that stabbed him's in the cell right across from him. That stuff happens. We talked about that stuff in my book, you know, with Aaron Pike and the dudes that got at him. Like the BOP doesn't really give a shit about you. You know, when you assist the government or do whatever he did, you would expect them to protect him, right? To send him to a prison where he's protected. Well, they don't always do that. Sometimes they put you in the line of fire. Nobody's down there in Grand Prairie like, hey, this is a special case. This guy right here, let's see. Let's not send him to this place. Ah, they don't care. And then they send him to North Carolina. He does all the complaining. They're like, we're going to help you out and give you everything you asked for. That shoe in North Carolina was one of the most vicious in the country at that time. All you could have in that shoe was a Bible. You weren't allowed newspapers. You weren't allowed books back then. So his life was hell. It went from being bad and being scared, right? I might get killed to, you know what? You're going to be in solitary confinement, the real deal, the shit you see in the movies. Eventually he complains and gets moved back to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. They stick him at an FCI where he's supposedly going to be safe. Everybody's safe down here in Tucson at the FCI. This guy's a dropout. And the brother chimed in and said, yo, bro, I know it was a dropout yard. Well, now we know, right? For sure. Dude's a dropout getting ready to go home worked with the government and decides, you know what? I don't feel like going home. And there's always those weirdos in the law library, jailhouse lawyers, right? But anyway, dude sealed his fate. He's on his way to the ADX. I mean, this is in the national media. This guy stabbed Derek Chauvin and the FBOP. It's a bad look for them, right? 
Dude's going to end up in ADX for the rest of his life. He can forget about going to state prison. He can forget about anything. He's never getting out. He's going to die in prison. Blood on the Razor Wire TV with respect. Until tomorrow, we're out. Thank you.